Hi, David Mendez here. This week, I am bringing you yet another great conversation from Season 2. In my interview with Prag Mahanti, you'll hear about his academic journey and about his evolving career path in the pharma industry. I'm sure you're going to enjoy this interview. So get your pen and paper and get ready to take notes. Somebody had told me that, hey, you should go to these competitions because if you don't like this, you won't like the job. And I loved that process. Like I loved working in a team, making a deck, presenting it to a group of people. Mm. And at that time, of course, it was like just interesting puzzles to solve, right? Yeah. The moment something that you like becomes a job, it's a little different. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but, but I loved that process. The same guy had actually told me that like any job, if you don't like the interview process, chances are you won't like the job. And this is something that I, I continue to kind of feel through all of the career progressions that I've made. That like if you don't really enjoy the process and the people you're meeting, then you're not going to like the people that you're going to work with. Mm-hmm. Because they represent the culture. Of the industry and of the company. Welcome to this week's episode of Papa PhD. Today I have with me Parag Mahanti. Parag received his PhD in chemistry and chemical biology in 2013 from Cornell University, where his research was focused on nuclear hormone receptors, steroid signaling, and metabolomics. Since then, he has moved careers thrice, first to consulting, then to finance, and currently in pharma. Outside of life sciences and biopharma strategy, Parag's passions include music, both playing and listening, biotech startups, and understanding the evolution of scientific reasoning and leadership skills. Parag takes an active interest in career progression of PhD students and has created a fast-growing LinkedIn group that currently has more than 5,000 members. Parag also serves as mentor for the Entrepreneurship Lab, eLab NYC, originally launched by the New York City Economic Development Corporation to provide mentorship to biotech, health tech startups in the New York area. I'm super happy, Parag, to have you on the show today. Thank you for being here. Hey, David. Good to see you. You have come from India to to study in the States. That's a whole adventure in and of itself. Tell your story a little bit in a couple of minutes so people get to know a little bit more of uh, of you, of who you are, and of... uh, and, and this will pre- you know, this will prepare our conversation for after, which is how you got to the position you're yeah. in today in terms of a job. Um, absolutely. The the story I think would start uh, when I was growing up in Calcutta, India, um, in a in a family that was very much interested in having a scientific career. My dad mm. pursued science. Uh, couldn't complete his own PhD because of financial reasons. Um, my uncle had a PhD. My elder brother had started a chemistry undergraduate course and then moved to engineering. So it was a very STEM-focused mm-hmm. culture and family. And so it was almost like, all right, you're going to study chemistry. And that was it. <laughs> <laughs> I had I had some faint, um, I had some faint uh, kind of, uh, I wanted to say that I wanted to study literature, but it didn't really work. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and so I studied chemistry for three years in India, and our bachelor's courses are three years. Mm-hmm. And that's when I started learning about, oh, you could actually go to the U.S. to do a Ph.D. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, how do you do that? People started telling me about GRE. Then I realized one year for master's is required, so I enrolled myself in a master's program. Mm-hmm. And throughout this time, I was like, all right, chemistry, bachelor's, master's, I'm going to do a PhD and become a professor, right? So that dream continues. Haven't we all had that dream? <laughs> so I came here because that was the goal, right? Like that was like, and and once again, you, if I contextualize it, uh, the culture that I grew up in pretty much um, really looked up to academics, right? And still does. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So... If you are a professor, uh, irrespective of, you know, your financial positions or whatever, you are revered, right? You're respected. And so, and respect is pretty much what people think uh, 
does everything in the world, which it doesn't, but like mm-hmm. whatever. Right? <laughs> Indian culture is very different than once I came here and, and I enrolled into a PhD program. I was like, oh, this is awesome. This is super cool, smart thinking stuff and I can thrive in this. And I started doing mm-hmm. that for first year and second year. And then by third year, I was like, no way. Like, I like the smart thinking part of it. I like the science, but I don't want to do this for the rest of my life. And the, mm. I think main reason was I love the science. In fact, I've stayed very close to the science most of my career. Um, but it was the impact of it, right? Like, mm-hmm. for some reason, I always thought the stuff that I was doing and it was not clinical translational work also, right? So it was not something that you would see immediate uh, immediate replies for, right? Mm-hmm. You would see the kind of work that I was doing. You would see maybe a return or a clinical development of it in like 10, 15, 20 years. So yeah. there's no immediate uh, translation of this work. So that was yeah, one about- reason. Talk, Talk about, about delayed the gratification there, exactly, right? Exactly, <laughs> right. And then the second thing, um, I will say this, that the, 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 some of the people who I saw pursuing at that time, right? Not, at, not right now because I've come away. But some of the people who I saw pursuing the assistant professor life or the professor life, I was like, do I really want to have that life, right? Like it mm-hmm. was, it was not, like I wasn't, Fortunately or unfortunately, I don't know, right? The the I don't know how it goes, but um, the people who I saw around my circle pursuing an academic life weren't weren't inspiring me to do so either, mm-hmm. right? And so then mm-hmm. I was like, okay, if that's the case, then what else is out there? And I that was third year, uh, and more importantly, I think it was more like, oh my god, I'm spending fifteen, sixteen hours a day in the lab. I need something else to do. So I enrolled myself in some random courses, which back then was more of an outlet. Mm -hmm. Now when I tell people to do the same thing, I ask them to actively do this because five years is an average, maybe six years is an average PhD time, right? In Europe, Mm -hmm. it's a little lesser. In um, non-STEM subjects, it's a little longer. But Mm -hmm. you're spending this time enrolled to a university and I came to that, like, suddenly some random music in my head went on. It's like, <laughs> dude, you didn't take a single course outside of your syllabus, and you're in one of the best universities in the world, and mm-hmm, it's been mm-hmm. paid for. Like, what? <laughs> Other than laziness, how can you justify this when you're done with this? And today, mm-hmm. outside of an university system, I can say, like, any of us who are not enrolled to a university have to pay a massive amount of money to take a course from a university like Cornell or anywhere, right? So Of course. Yeah. So I know myself in history of rock music, right? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and, and Entrepreneurship 101, right? Okay. And both those courses I audited, and, and I was like, wow, this is, this is pretty interesting. And I met a whole bunch of new people. And then from that, I started realizing, oh, just like undergrad, grad school also has clubs that you could join. Mm-hmm. Right and has has societies that you could join, and so, and so I started joining the graduate society, joined the consulting club, joined the finance club, and again, all of this is to just to kind of spend a little time away from lab, just to keep mm-hmm. my sanity. Not necessarily. I have a que- yeah, yeah, I have a question. No, I I didn't do enough of that. Although eventually got again, you know, when I was towards the, f- the final years of my PhD, I started also trying to to widen my horizons a little bit and and finding resources and and you know career counseling things like that um but how did you uh manage the time to to you know to be implicated in, in these different things and how was that perceived maybe around you in the lab because uh, often one of the obstacles we have to uh, as a phd student to do these things is this is going to be perceived as me disinvesting uh, from from my research and it's going to disappoint you know my supervisor and maybe my peers can you talk a little bit about that yeah so yeah both of them are <laughs> super interesting questions right so number one of, of how do i manage the time um i i uh and by the way today i would say i'm trying to practice what i preach 
but you will mm-hmm. see me preaching a lot about imposter syndrome and mm-hmm. kind of not not feeling insecure about how much you have achieved these days right totally different yeah. mentality <laughs> 12 years back okay or, or or 10 years back um back then i was like oh my god i i have 16 hours of lab work i have 7 hours left um but i cannot be sane by just the 16 hours of lab work i will push in two more year two more hours of additional okay. stuff right um and so this is not the, this is not new the rope to, a little bit yeah this is not <laughs> new to grad school i was i was i i spread myself too thin in undergrad as well mm-hmm. and people said like what impacted was my sleep rather than anything else right mm-hmm. so like mm-hmm. I did my work that I had to do in undergrad, but then I did a whole bunch of other extracurricular work. And then I was like, oh my God, I have to sleep. And I slept for three, four hours, right? So Mm -hmm. time management back then was more like how much, uh, how worse I can treat myself (laughs) 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 to to get the stuff. uh, There was no time management. I'll be very honest, right? There was no time management. If I would have managed my time better, I think mm-hmm. um, I could have done a lot of other things that and and a lot of other things better. And mm-hmm. the other thing I will say here, though, is um, thankfully and fortunately, I met my wife during my PhD mm-hmm. here um, in 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 Cornell, Ithaca, and that was a big kind of support system, right? Because like there were certain things you're not spending time like you. I found her. We were interested in each other. We dated, and then done like check mark on that so there was no more (laughs) spending time on finding another person and in relationships Mm -hmm. i think that was um another kind of like all right i can now focus on work and i like i can now focus on extracurriculars Mm -hmm. it it kind of grounded you in a way it did exactly and to be honest for all the people who love ithaca i mean i like i like ithaca for what it is but it's uh it's the middle of nowhere right (laughs) So you have to, like, for someone like me who's super extracurricular and extroverted, I had to involve myself in a bunch of things. So it was, again, Mm -hmm. more of a necessity than a hobby for me, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the time management question. And then the question of um, how was it perceived? I I don't think my um, advisor knew that I was part of the consulting club, finance club, and the graduate society. Mm-hmm. Well, the, the, clearly by the by the way you you did it, which was just to put more waking hours in your day, I think you you circumvented that that situation. Right, 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 <laughs> right. So coming back to the question of um, who, how did people perceive it? So let's break it in chunks, right? My boss was okay as long as work was done, and he, as, I mean, the flexibility nowadays. Many companies give infinite days of vacation. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like that, right? Okay. And in finite days of vacation, to be honest, I don't. I mean, I don't know. What, it basically <laughs> puts pressure on you, right? <laughs> uh, because it seems like you can take any day, any time off, but it's not. It's exactly the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's well. Like, if you're if you're a perfectionist, you're in trouble because right. you'll always think, okay, I didn't do enough. I don't. I don't get to to take my vacation now. <laughs> yes. And so for for us. Um, my, my schedule and, and during PhD was, I would, I would probably roll into lab on nine 30 ish, 10 ish, uh, mm-hmm. work for until afternoon, then take a break, leave, go do other stuff. Um, uh, in between, if I took classes or something that's separate, then maybe come back again after dinner, which was usually around like eight, eight thirty, and, or maybe later ah. nine and then work the night shift until like whatever, one thirty two. Okay. it didn't matter so much. And so um, my advisor didn't know what was like, the other stuff didn't take time, right? Mm-hmm. So as long as work was getting done, he was fine. And he was an assistant professor. So he was, of course, under the tenure gun, which is why the the work, uh, the, the, the intensity of the work was high. Um, However, there was an internship that I did in tech transfer office at Cornell for which I had to kind of like actually have a discussion with him and say like, hey, this is not going to take time away from research. 
um, and and I had to convince him for that, right? Okay. So, so if you were asking whether um, advisors would be usually easily convinced, absolutely not. I mean, <laughs> my advisor is not a representation of it. In general, I don't think people understand unless they are sat down maybe by their, like the graduate committee or something and made explain to them that, hey, this is important for the career development and the overall development of a student. People don't understand these things. Like they're like, mm -hmm. you're wasting time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so no, I, I think, I, think I, I didn't experience anything special. It was not as if that my advisor was like, Yes, green light to everything. Go do whatever you want. That was not the mm -hmm. case. Some of it he just didn't know because I was doing in the side, and some of it I just had to convince him. Right mm -hmm. now, here are things that I am telling you that I did. There were things where I wanted to do and I couldn't. Right. Okay. So it was kind of a negotiation. Like, all right, I couldn't do that, so let me do this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good. It does answer my question. I think it represents the reality for a lot of people. Again, like you said, the pressure that the the, the supervisor is on will transfer to this to the students. Uh, and and uh, of course, if you're choosing your PhD, depending on how how well you deal with pressure and stress, maybe this could inform where you know what lab, uh, what supervisor you choose. Choose someone who's maybe no longer under the gun under the gun of the the tenure. Uh, the tenure track, uh, you know, they they're already tenured. That could be. That it's could a be it's a balance. Have. It's a it's. I mean, if you're if you are under if you are working with an assistant professorship who's going for tenure, the chances that you're going to get a larger, more than average number of papers is very high, mm -hmm. because the, the, he is up on the gun for publishing, and so mm -hmm. if you are one of his first few grad students. You're pretty much setting up the lab with him and part of all the projects that he has just started because he mm -hmm. hasn't diverged, you know, different projects yet. So mm -hmm. pretty much m almost uh, most of our grad students that were part of that, sir, and I was one of them, the, the group of six or so that, that was part of his lab initially, each of us came out of PhD with like seven papers, not all of them wow, first author, of huge. course. But like, just even seven is a is a number that that people are like, huh, seven papers. Not that I'm like, I need those seven papers anymore. But now, if I look back at it, I'm like, well, those were really tough days. But yeah, I mean, it it's productive. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the the con of working with a younger professor is he is still making his own network, so he may not know that many people for you to know as well. Mm -hmm. Whereas an established professor who has been there for a while, knows pretty much everybody in the field, kind of mm -hmm. figure out, all right, go do this with this guy. Or, hey, mm -hmm. you don't have to worry about a postdoc. I'll make a phone call and you can go somewhere else, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. you also, also be less stressed about being scooped uh, or, 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 you know, which can be very, very, very stressful for a very young professor. I, yes, agreed. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> the projects <laughs> that we worked on had two other labs working on them, one of them in Germany, the other in Korea. We were mm -hmm. in New York. And so one, <laughs> one of the things that we said in our lab um, was the competition never sleeps because <laughs> of where they were. And it's yeah, just yeah, yeah. like you, I'm laughing at it now, but back then it was one of those things like, yeah, you have to like, you know, keep on working. <laughs> That's funny. That's fun. Just because of 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 uh, the of time geography. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> very cool. Now, Parag, uh, it's it's very interesting that you you kind of invested in this. Let's say networking. It, it wasn't probably you probably didn't per perceive it as that. You were trying new things, uh, learn learning new subjects, mm -hmm. and and well, and and getting in, involved in groups that worked into in things that interested you, uh, but. I think we can talk about networking and how this translates to some of the things you do today a little bit later. Now, I, I just wanted to finish this part about your your trajectory and, and you know how you came to to work in pharma with this the the maybe the moment where you felt because you already mentioned it you saw people around you following the academic path and you didn't you didn't see yourself 
it didn't resonate with you and maybe it even you even said okay no this is really i wouldn't thrive in this environment can you maybe talk a little bit about when you actually said okay i need to start looking for what's coming next and it's not in academia and how yeah, you how, you know what were the key maybe strategies that you that you used to you know start meeting people something that led to let's say your first position outside of academia yeah um so this is a layered question right so first thing that i would say is around that third year was the time of that i you call it revelation turning point whatever it was was mm -hmm. the point where kind of a voice in my mind said prague academia probably isn't for you and mm -hmm. it came with all the pangs of um imposter syndrome of like uh grief that oh my god i've i've given five plus three eight years with two mm -hmm. more years to go into studying a subject that i'm now going to be planning to leave and not really do much about it right um and it didn't help that pretty much 99% of my friend circle of my uh family knew if there was one thing that they knew was the academic track right of course and mm -hmm. and and maybe academic track isn't the right word research track or r&d track right so even if they were mm -hmm. outside of quote unquote academia they were doing r&d in like other places So okay. that that was the kind of starting point of like all right I know I want to not do research but now what do I do and this is mm -hmm. the way I would break it down for those who are currently in their PhD programs or postdoc is first come to the realization of is it a binary yes or no because it is a binary um mm -hmm. people start thinking oh no maybe let's do a postdoc and then I will realize do it only if you are forced to do it and and international students have that issue often because you want to go into a you know a postdoc because you otherwise you mm -hmm. lose immigration status but that question is binary do i want to continue this or not and once mm -hmm. that question is answered even because a lot of people will tell me well maybe the moment you said maybe the answer is actually no because <laughs> you will know if you want i mean it's it's not that tough right so once you make yeah. that decision um or it comes to you that maybe this is not what i want to do then starts the whole question that you are asking of how do i find out what is it that i want to do mm -hmm. and the first thing that i did was figure realize that my immediate network my friends are amazing but they didn't know anything about what I wanted to do outside of PhD. Yeah. And so that was kind of the reason why I realized oh my god I'm so glad I joined these societies. Cuz <laughs> suddenly I was with people who were from biomedical engineering or mechanical engineering and somehow people who are in the engineering PhD track I don't know why uh they just know more <laughs> about mm -hmm. stuff outside of science. Right. It's more of an applied domain, exactly. right? So yeah. I guess that 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 would be the reason they they probably have already done some internships. Exactly. Uh, right. they, so they're yeah they're more attuned to that. Whereas where you and I come from, it's more uh, basic research. You know, just to to accumulate knowledge. And, exactly and, that, know. right? Mm -hmm. So uh, so I think so. I was lucky in that sense that I met a few people who kind of sat me down and said, "Hey." you are extroverted you like working with people you like smart problems maybe consulting is something you should look at mm -hmm. this happened to me somebody said like a few few people said prag based on what your personality is consulting seems to be a good line of thought right mm -hmm. did you hear what prag just said Widening his circle of contacts during graduate school gave him access to an also wider hive mind to bounce ideas with and get advice from. I've said it before, but staying cooped up in your lab or your department is a loss of opportunity of fully taking advantage of the possibilities and resources graduate school and university offer. Parag then drilled down on his question a little more. Um and then i had heard about consulting companies while in india as well i just didn't know what they do 
Um, but I had heard that they were like really smart places to get into. And you, if you get into them, people kind of start thinking of you as like a smart person, which is of course <laughs> always one of the things that you want to, you know, um, I'm not saying it's a good thing. I'm just saying it happens. <laughs> it's a human thing. Yeah. Um, so that kind of started me getting more interested in, in consulting as a career. I will say there was a, and it still is, but I don't think it's monitored well, but I think somebody has done a good job in taking that website and kind of archiving it. The website's called phdcareerguide.com. Okay. Um, it, I think it was done by, I'm, I, I will not actually try to name or guess the name <laughs> because I forget, but it was done by a postdoc, I think at Rutgers. Okay. And what it did, this guy basically probably went through the same uh, same discussions that as we were going through or, you mm -hmm. know, same thought processes. And he put a whole bunch of resources in a very, very well organized way in one website. And what it means is that you click on careers and it shows IP, consulting, finance, tech transfer, okay. communications, and you click on them. And each of them opens up on a page and it tells you what that job is, what is the average salary, and what are the companies that hire for that job, right? So suddenly you have an encyclopedia where I was like, whoa, seriously, I can do all of these things? <laughs> and somehow this is interesting now when I look back, back at, the, at time, 2011, I wasn't interested in finance. So I really mm -hmm. didn't even click on that tab. All I clicked on was consulting, entrepreneurship, SciComm. So science, I was interested in science communication. And I figured out, okay, these are the companies that need that, that go through that. And then over one weekend, and he had listed about, I don't know, 150 consulting companies. So he pretty much, oh, wow. had, okay. so like alphabetically, I don't think he listed it. I think he just grabbed somebody else's list because you have these mm -hmm. encyclopedias, right? Of, of and over a weekend, I had a little small notebook. I went through each of those websites to see who hires PhDs. Okay. And okay, so, like, okay. I had a net notebook of, like, all right, this one, this one. So now I have a list of 17 companies out of the 150 that hire PhDs, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I started realizing, okay, I started talking to people and say, okay, which companies are good and bad? And that's when I realized McKinsey, BCG, Bain are, like, the top three then there are others, but I did that. And mm -hmm. again, if I have to give actionable advice, there, I mean, the amount of time you spend on something is directly proportional to the impact of it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, one can say, one can talk about luck, fate, uh, un, you know, unexpected mm -hmm. uh, outliers. Serendipity. But things like this, this is research. This is what we are taught to do for five years. And yeah. we are taught to research <laughs> other stuff for publications. Unfortunately, we don't do enough, quote unquote, research for our own careers, <laughs> which is which is just not the good idea. Like we know how research can be done. We know, fine, let's get the information first, then let's filter it down to a few things and then finally we know the thought process. We just don't yeah. apply it for career. Um, and I'm not <laughs> yeah, it's saying like, I it's learned... as if it's as if we're it's it's we're it's a country that we don't know the language. So we see pla we see uh, bo you know billboards or uh, or plates that are probably indicating the subway, but yeah. it's written in Cyrillic. <laughs> yeah, and we we just don't you know we just we we know how to use the subway. But just because we're in a context that's foreign, that's maybe, uh, you know, uh, um, fear inducing. Yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, no, I, I'll take your I'll take your uh, analogy and drive it a little more. Right. If you go to Boston, mm -hmm. I, I love I love Boston as a city just because of this reason. If you go to Boston because it's a it's a like a biotech Silicon Valley. Right. Mm -hmm. Um. If you go to the subway of Boston, the ads within this Boston subway are all biotech companies, right? Now, now when you're taking the subway in Boston, you're looking at all these ads. If you're somebody who's doing a PhD and doesn't know these biotech companies, 
I mean, right now, if you're listening to this and you're in Boston, just go through the ads and find out what these companies do. Because, because you know, you, you, you pass ads holdings, just like you said, without knowing what they are or caring about it. Mm. Boston is one city where because I'm in biotech or in, in pharma, every ad I see, I'm like, oh, wow, they have an ad here. Oh, they have that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's interesting, right? And when, yeah. if, I was, if I were to somehow transpose myself into like third year of PhD, I wouldn't know the name of many of these companies. Mm -hmm, and I would course. just walk beside them without knowing what they are. And that's, mm. that's like the same thing. It's, it's if you just, you, this is happening beside you in the, your surrounding, find out what it is, right? Like, mm -hmm. um, anyway, it's a good analogy. It's a good analogy. <laughs> that's the, so that's the story of, um, me realizing that consulting could have been a, a would, would be a good thing. And mm -hmm. then I just joined, I, mean, I had already joined the consulting club. I just took a leadership position there. Okay. And I started organizing consulting meetings, like people coming together and, and cracking or trying to solve a case interview question. Okay, cool. And that's when I realized, oh, okay, there are these case interview competitions that happen. Oh, wow. So we formed a team among a few people and we went to different universities. We won a couple of competitions and that pretty much solidified because somebody had told me that, hey, you should go to these competitions because if you don't like this, you won't like the job. And I love okay. that process. Like I loved working in a team, making a deck, presenting it to a group of people. Mm -hmm. And at that time, of course, it was like just interesting puzzles to solve, right? Yeah. The moment something that you like becomes a job, it's a little different. <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but, but I love that process. The same guy had actually told me that like any job, if you don't like the interview process, chances are you won't like the job. And this is okay. something that I, I continue to kind of feel through all of the career progressions that I've made that like, if you don't really enjoy the process and the people you're meeting, then you're not going to like the people that you're going to work with. Mm -hmm. Because they represent the culture, they represent the culture of, of the you, industry you. and of the company mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and consulting any networking event I went to my first question. And my only question was, what is it that you like about the job? Because if you ask anybody, if you ask me, the job is taxing, the job is stressful. It will take a chunk of your life when you're doing it. Um, depending mm -hmm. on companies, it'll, the hours will change depending on who you're working with. The interesting part of it will change but it will be stressful. Um, mm. and, and when people told me that, then I was like, all right, if it is so stressful, why are these people, why are these smart people doing this? And so that was my only question every time I asked in a networking event, like, why do, do you like consulting? And pretty much 100% of the answers were people. Everybody okay. said they are doing consulting because of the people they work with. Mm -hmm. And that was enough for me. Like for me, as again, as an extrovert, I was like, "Oh yeah, I want to know more people, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and more interesting." It's funny. I, I, I went when I was uh, at, at McGill. I went to a presentation by Kin by McKinsey, and the guy who was presenting, it, it's it, you know, it sounded very interesting. But then he mentioned uh, that uh, I think I think his weeks were uh, eighty hour weeks. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and uh, you know, to me, it showed even on his face that he, that you know it, that he was tired or you know or spent like like you were saying but if you're passionate about it and if you know if the 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 pluses for you uh are are more important than the the, the drawbacks for sure dive in yeah now no. now you you had two other two other like pivots let's say yeah uh, and this this thing of, of pivoting um, is always a moment. There's always a, a moment of um, maybe f not fragility is maybe not the word that I'm looking for, but you are going into this new swimming pool where you don't really know the rules yeah. yet. Uh, you you might have imposter syndrome once you get the position. Um, but what would you say were your go to strategies to uh, one one you already said research. Research, research, and and try to know, you know, even though you ha you're not in the industry, know as as much as possible as you can before going in, and even before the interview process. Right. But how did you prepare for for an interview? You already mentioned talking with people, so informational interviews for sure must be one of your go-to yeah. strategies. But um, 
what would you say for people who are you know straight out of the phd what's the maybe three things they should invest in in preparing for this because it's going to happen multiple times in your life yep. changing yep. changing jobs right yep so so <clears throat> it's interesting um i'll i'll start from a higher level and and go deeper down into the question right the one thing that i've always realized now on hindsight is that i'm lucky to to have a little bit lucky to have an extra extroverted personality because mm-hmm. that makes things easier for me to talk to people for sure right mm-hmm. um and that's pretty much my first point talking to people as many people as you can is pretty much the only way uh, opportunities that don't show up on job pages will open up to you that's yeah. like you can call it networking you can call it uh whatever but it comes down to building relationships by talking to people and mm-hmm. it does not mean you go to a of course with covid now that's not the case anymore but for those yeah. who remember it does not mean you go to a cocktail networking session and just exchange business cards it means once you have exchanged those business cards during thanksgiving or during the holiday season sending them a note sending mm-hmm. them like hey you know happy new year or whatever keeping that network going finding an article that you think person xyz might be interested in and sending it to them you are mm-hmm. not doing this to get a job like that's i i might be like skipping a few steps here but people say oh so i should make relationships so that i can ask them for a job absolutely no like it'll never work cuz mm-hmm. those relationships will never work so let me take a step back part 1 talk to people um part 2 and in fact this could be number 1 know what you like and what you don't like one of the things mm-hmm. that i learned a lot from my consulting interviews was that i sat down mckinsey has a great resource of how you should prepare for their interviews i would suggest everybody even those who are not per, like preparing for consulting interviews should do that mm-hmm. why okay because they tell you how to break down yourself and your personality right mm-hmm. now i actually spent a couple of days breaking down these are the things that i did why did i do them blah 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 and you can call it introspection you can call it career prep interview prep but i i go back to that notebook i have that notebook for 12 well 10 years now 8 mm-hmm. years now where i have these like little strategy trees of like i did this most likely because of this and this mm-hmm. shows this and this mm-hmm. goes back to like time of my phd of different skill sets so number 1 talking to people number 1 introspect number 2 introspecting mm-hmm. and then number 3 is flexibility i can i can be even more cliche and say being easy on yourself this is not easy for most of us i can tell you for a fact that there were there have been and there is still times when i'm like oh why can't i do this i'm a phd mm-hmm. blah 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 i can stay up for 18 hours straight or 48 hours straight and you know finish this job why do i bring that in a job search environment there are there are two things that people will face and i have faced this multiple times where you will think this is the job that you want and you will not get it if you tell yourself at that point that oh my god i am the person at fault here that's you being hard on yourself mm-hmm. and my first job search in consulting taught me that my third my last job search that ultimately led to me joining novartis taught me that or reminded me that is that these things are not about my abilities these things are about a mutual fit mm-hmm. and it does not at all mean that i'm not capable to do something it just means at that time that company didn't want somebody with my skill set mm-hmm. and that's good enough for me to just as long as i tell myself that and th- these are <laughs> these are um things that we just keep telling ourselves and say make you know make it look good but that's not mm-hmm. what it is it's it's really 
something that we should be aware of because I have done this myself. I know other people have done it where they get a rejection, then they start questioning themselves and then they never apply again. Mm -hmm. And one rejection means actually absolutely nothing. Two doesn't mean anything. Just as a fact, between my second, my last job and the one where I was in Novartis, mm -hmm. um, I applied 10 times and probably had eight rejections. Right? That's a 20% success rate. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's it's a great point you make. And, uh, you know, there's many things that this elicits for me. We're in the middle of COVID. People are often alone at home. They can have, a ne you know, negative self-thought can be, uh, you know, uh, yeah. really uh, having a bad impact on, on their day-to-day -day mental health. And taking it personally when you receive uh, when you have a rejection is just going to worsen things right one of the things that recently in an interview that I, that i've just recorded the person actually said use the rejection as a positive so and what they meant was if you can and especially if you've gone to through an interview process and then the answer was no get back in touch take note of the name of the person interviewing you get back in touch with them and even though they might not even answer but ask them how could i how could i improve on on what i did what were the 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 main factors that meant that the other candidate got the job and make a plus out of a minus exactly exactly right i think asking for feedback is one of the biggest things or biggest mistakes that most people don't do and i didn't mm -hmm. do it until the first you know until the second set of jobs that i applied right like i didn't mm -hmm. learn this the first time around mm -hmm. and then i realized well, what is the difference between this interview that I didn't get and this interview that I didn't get? I didn't learn anything from this. <laughs> like, like I have to learn something. And you know, you're, you're spot on, on on that, right? So going back to your original question, if there were three things that I would ask people to do, I would say talk to as many people as you can who are different from what you are doing. If you are a mm -hmm. physics PhD, go talk to somebody who's doing humanities PhDs, right? Like find ways, find, and people would mostly say, well, I don't have a network. Um, David Mendes, Prague Mahanti are creating those networks for you. Yep. We are actively and daily, uh, and that's how we met, uh, uh, trying to create networks of like-minded, uh, although not all from the same domain, but like-minded people on LinkedIn. Right. And that was actually, I, I, was, I, had that, I had a segue, which because you were telling people should try to meet people, people with different backgrounds. And I was totally se going to segue onto that because one of the things we wanted to, I wanted to talk is, well, how can people today from their home network in, in an environment that's professional uh, and that's uh, yeah that that yeah. where we're we're talking about careers and talking about uh, jobs is is just natural. And uh, you have uh, with with a group of people created uh, and I mentioned I mentioned it in the intro a fairly large group uh, on LinkedIn. Can you talk a little bit about that? And we're reaching the end of the interview, but I think we can finish on that on how today with COVID locked down maybe at home you can still work to our, towards a you know a larger network and which eventually although now not directly like you mentioned also you you're not going to talk to someone and they'll give you a job but the amount of conversations you have on a platform like this may eventually bring up you know make make bring a contact with someone else who might think of you and say oh you know i had a chat with this bloke <laughs> from from uh, montreal who would would actually and then and then things can happen yeah so um just to summarize for the so meet people be flexible and the second one was um i have to go back and and listen to the recording but almost like basically go go meet people Try to find out what you have done and, and the, how, the introspection, yeah. introspection, and then uh, flexibility. Right, all of these three things when you double click has other stuff in it. Mm -hmm. The first one, meet new people, as you said, is LinkedIn. That was my first thing to learn in PhD. One of my colleagues said, "Hey, have you tried the premium membership of LinkedIn?" Right, mm -hmm. and I I took a premium membership while in PhD, not knowing okay. how much it would help. Through LinkedIn, I got my first job. I oh, applied wow. okay. through LinkedIn, sent my resume, 
The job came up on LinkedIn, sent my resume through LinkedIn. Somebody messaged me back on LinkedIn messaging, set up an interview, one interview for 90 minutes or so. And okay. I got, and then the final interview and I got the job. This okay, is not amazing. the job that I, I, I didn't know this story. story. <laughs> yeah. So, so, and this is 2013 or 12. Um, eight years have passed since then and LinkedIn has only become more powerful. So mm -hmm. anybody who tells me no, LinkedIn doesn't work, they haven't used it enough. They haven't mm -hmm. used it properly. And if people ask, we spend money on random things. LinkedIn is an investment. So if mm -hmm. somebody's asking, mm -hmm. how do you meet people? You meet people through LinkedIn. Um, same story now, if you look at it, because of the same situation where I was one of the few who had gotten a consulting job, random people would then message me or email me and say, hey, can I talk to you? Because mm -hmm. even if it was like there were a lot of people who were doing consulting after PhD, but whatever the reason was within my friend circle, not many. And so then okay. their friends would call me up. And that's when I started realizing enough people need, um, need support, need more people mm -hmm. to talk to. So that's when we started thinking, or rather, I, I mean, I had a blog that didn't really, I didn't really invest time in it, which I call mm -hmm. academic inertia. And <laughs> which was like, you know, you can keep doing what you want, or you can stop. But unless there's an external poor force, you're not changing what you're doing. And that's, that's mm -hmm. inertia. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of led me to meet a couple of people in New York, who had an alumni club. Um, okay. from an Indian university. And so I had my ideas. So I kind of started collaborating with them and became a co-founder of this Facebook group that was focused on Indian students mm -hmm. after PhD. Uh, but it was purely Facebook. And that's when I started the LinkedIn group saying, okay, okay. we don't, I think the LinkedIn group is going to be more important. Also, uh, that group was mostly Indian students and I wanted to have, and STEM students mostly. And my okay. plan or Very my focused. thought was always go bigger, go broader. And so the LinkedIn group started that way. And that was back in 2016. So 2016, I'm, I'm doing consulting. Then I moved to equity research, which is another high intensity, high demanding job. So I don't get to spend too much time on the, on the LinkedIn front. But once after I came to Novartis, which is, of course, also high intensity, high demanding, but I could mm -hmm. now find a rhythm. And I knew how much time I could spend on anything. So end of last year, I started realizing, you know what, time is now good to kind of invest time in this. And so that's when PhD Career Networking Group on LinkedIn became kind of like one of the things that I was spending time on. Anytime, okay. like outside of work hours, I would kind of like, all right, who do I need to know? By this time, remember these four years, I have met a bunch of people who are doing things. So like mm -hmm. Roshni Rao, somebody I would mention, She's doing amazing things in John Hop Johns Hopkins. I knew that she's there. Not that yeah. we started talking, but I knew she exists. Same thing with <laughs> Vanya, right? Vey has been doing an enormous amount of great stuff with Free the PhD. And I was like, I knew Vanya exists, right? So there, mm -hmm. was, there were these little thought leaders who were all doing their own little amazing things. And I was like, okay, first step, how can I get a bunch of these thought leaders into this group so that people actually get get advice that is from people who have been there, done that. Mm. Because the other part of making a group like this is that if you get a bunch of people who are all looking for jobs, how can they really help you, right? Yeah. So you yeah. First There's no have, value uh, added. There's yeah. no value added. So you start with people who actually have gotten the jobs, and then you can start getting people who are looking for mentorship, right? So you get the mentors mm -hmm. first, and then, so that was kind of a little bit of strategy uh, but earlier in the year and then it was kind of just trying to create regular content and creating mm -hmm. content you're creating content which is kind of robust original and you've been doing that so I, I found out about you through I think Twitter somebody mentioned and I was like yay you know probably Twitter I, yes <laughs> we somehow through the same situations I found Vera um, and mm -hmm. Vera is doing awesome stuff too right and so yeah. suddenly, this is this is an actual example where you start finding people through LinkedIn and through Twitter and connect the dots and say, mm -hmm. hey, maybe this person is good for you to talk to. 
that's something mm-hmm. I will take a little bit of credit is I'm is I'm good at. I'm good at connecting dots when dots are people, right? I'm good mm-hmm. at connecting people. If two people I think are 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 supposed are should be meeting each other, then I'm like, hey, I think David, you should talk to Anupam mm-hmm. or you know, David, you should talk to Roshni or somebody like that. Yeah, so, and, and I confirm to the listeners that this this has happened. I've had <laughs> messages saying, "Hey, look at what this person posted. You might want to talk to them." <laughs> but so this this all makes me think of this this. Um, you know the saying that it takes a village to to um, uh, to uh, uh, bring up a child, and it, what it makes me think there's kind of a parallel with uh, with us who are and, and with people who are looking for jobs. It takes a community to to uh, make you grow into a, a better candidate and to lead you to your next position. It does. What would you? Say? No, I think I think the 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 other thing that most people make a mistake of is that if you are getting unidimensional advice, then it's unidimensional and it's binary. Either that person is right or wrong. Mm -hmm. If you're getting (laughs) advice from a community, then people with different experiences and different, you know, I can tell people now about my experience in consulting and finance and how both of them helped me in my Nufaris positions, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody says, oh, consulting jobs don't, lead to any interesting things i am i can contest that the same thing is if i say well you know consulting and finance can only lead to novartis like jobs and then you Uh go talk to nick edwards who has done like you know consulting entrepreneurship and then he has hired a strategy position at at another company no it's different so career paths, as much as people want to templatize it, as much as people want to kind of say, like, how can I get that job? These are not formulas, and therefore you need more than one people to 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 share their experience. That is why mm-hmm. stuff that you are doing, right? Like you have seventy six episodes, seventy five episodes now. These mm-hmm. are this this is a plethora of information that people not shouldn't be thinking. Oh. Person X Y Z said this, and therefore they should do that. No, you should be thinking. Person X said this, and person Y said this, and person Z said this. Mm-hmm. Together, this means I should. That's the concept of the community yeah. that I think. Like it cannot be. Yeah, and and then the, the prism of your because you talked about introspection, you you get two or three or three or four pieces of input, and the prism of your values, of your preferences, of your personality will even then transmute that into. Okay. Yes, it makes sense to me. Or even you'll have a fourth idea or a fifth idea. Oh, interesting that they yeah. say that. This it made me think of this new thing that no one has absolutely uh, has said before. Yeah, it, you've seen this in our group, right? There has been discussions that are so amazing, and it doesn't just have to be in the group. If I give a very easy example, again on LinkedIn, uh, you are you're probably familiar with the discussion that's happening today, and wh- whoever is listening to this this. Uh, podcast at a later time will this is not be today for them but get mm-hmm. post yes right? that's an amazing <laughs> post so just it's for true. the listeners there's another content creator here great get trude non on linkedin and i know her previously through linkedin and she posted mm-hmm. hey who are the other linkedin creators and somebody else tagged me and said prague is one of the people <laughs> i came in and tagged you know, another bunch of people, David got tagged by four or five different people. Yeah. <laughs> and suddenly, Gatroot's post has 99 likes and 99 comments. And there are, it is in that post alone is an encyclopedia of LinkedIn content creators. Suddenly, mm. like, and so it's, it did not happen because of one person. And it cannot happen because of one person. It's so funny because someone who was on the show uh, in, the, in season one, also was tagged and appeared. I was like, "Oh, he's commenting on Gertrude's post," and and he's saying, "Oh, we should start a Discord channel." For, and it's true, the potential that you have in the, on this platform is is pretty huge. It's pretty huge. No, I'm, I'm, thank you for being part of it, David. I cannot say this enough to all the people who are part of the community. That uh, earlier in 2020, knowing that there was a pandemic, I was a little kind of like, "Oh my God!" As an extrovert, I was going insane and this community kind of like was 
whoa, this is another way to meet people. And then suddenly 5,000 people join. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm like, we, again, by, at the date of this episode, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, the, the, there was a, they crossed, so the, the group crossed the, the mark of 5,000 members, which is yes. pretty huge. Yes, yes, yes. And just for the listeners, David, um, uh, David also has, David and I have collaborated to create a similar group for French-speaking uh, audiences that mm -hmm. reached 100 members within the last three months, right? Yeah, so, yep. it's true. So there is <laughs> another just, group that's just happening did. for those who speak French. David has a group yep. where I am part of and the other members of the PhD Career Networking Group are part of. That has 100 that people true. already, so that's growing too. Uh, so listeners will know that this is a bilingual podcast. Each week we switch from French to English and, and so on. And uh, I, I approached Prague. I said, Prague, I love the the, the way this group uh, works. The, the And I think it would be great to make a group uh, in French and with the offers and and uh, and um, discussions that would be in French and it's growing well and I'm I'm super happy that I approached you about that. I remember at first you were a bit like, you know, well actually said okay we should meet and talk. You probably you didn't know me that well, right? <laughs> and now I, I'm I'm really really happy I did it. And again I I really hope that eventually I'll uh, reach the same number as as uh, the the father or the mother. <laughs> No, I think I think um, I think there's a lot of value in uh, in kind of creating such many groups. Uh, the the only discussion that I wanted to have with you because the moment you had reached out to us, I was like, in my mind, I can I can share this now. In my mind, was like, well, David mm -hmm. is probably the best person to handle something like that, right? And the only thing that I wanted to understand was that I knew you were in Canada. I was like, you're starting a French group. Are you wanting to go back to France or, or, or not back to France, but are you wanting to go to France um, or something like that? So if if somebody comes in with like another such example of like, hey, let's do a Spanish version of this. Right now, mm -hmm. they need to have the 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 impact that you have already had. Like I consider you as a thought leader in the space. I don't know enough Spanish thought leaders in the space, right? So, like, <laughs> yeah. who are those people? And so that's the, the, the kind of the thought process. But I'm so glad mm -hmm. to have collaborated with you on that. And, and, and I'm glad that we are talking today, therefore. Right? Like, yeah, yeah. No, it's true. Parag, yeah, sadly, we, we've, uh, we've reached the end of the interview. I think we covered uh, a lot of uh, really great points. I really appreciate the fact that you, uh, you have done different pivots af even after the PhD. And I think that makes it, that your input really interesting because you've you've tuned you know this it's a it's kind of a process that you've gone through multiple times and you have you know you've you've been tuning it each time you've been improving the way that, like you said uh, at the beginning you didn't ask for feedback and now it's something that's part of it and i think if if there's one thing that i apart from all the advice that you shared and i'll share the links that you mentioned in the show notes one of the things is this is a process you get better at it as you go. When you get a no, when you get a rejection, it's part of the process. It's a, a step towards the yes. Yeah. And it's a it's an opportunity to improve and to get better and to eventually uh, have that meeting with that group that fits your values. You are a good fit with them and they'll say yes. That is exactly right. Thank you, David. That's, I mean, I could have summarized it better. <laughs> Thanks a lot for having been on Papa PhD. Thank you, David. It was a pleasure. And keep doing the great work that you are doing. Awesome. I'll keep trying. <laughs> what a great conversation this was. I hope you took notes. As an extra note, the Grad Grid now has over 9,000 members on LinkedIn and is still growing and going strong. Come visit and chat with some great members of the PhD tribe. And if the Papa PhD interviews have helped you in any way in finding your career path, you can always show your support on buymeacoffee.com or on Patreon. It will be really, really, really appreciated. If you don't do yet, follow Papa PhD on social media, on Twitter and on Instagram. The handle is at Papa PhD Podcast. Also, if you like YouTube, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. We just crossed 200 subscribers and it would be great to see you over there. So thank you and see you next week for another episode of Papa PhD.